Hey everyone, welcome to part one of the Forensic Pixology series for Classic Amiga computers. We had to break this up into two parts because the Classic Amigas really breaks into two separate types of hardware, the Classic OCS slash ECS hardware, and then many years later the AGA chipset. So not only are we going to cover both chipsets, uh, AGA taking part in maybe the later half of the second video, but the other issue is, unlike almost all consoles, there are very, very different techniques and approaches for doing graphics for your game on classic Amigas. And so it, a lot more time needs to be spent to cover those uh, technical aspects of graphics for these systems. Hey everyone, I am here with Corey. Say hi, Corey. Hey, how's it going? And today we're happy to be doing the Forensic Pixology video about the classic uh, Amiga computer uh, or line of computers. And uh, that's uh, what the game you see here is Shadow of the Beast, which is a quintessential or very famous um, classic Amiga game. And this game runs on the original generation Amigas, which were called OCS, which means original chipset. And then later the ECS or enhanced chipset was introduced. And this video is going to cover those two chipsets overall, which were extremely similar. Much later on in the life of Amiga computers, they introduced the AGA or advanced graphics architecture uh, chipset, but that was later in its life and far fewer games were made that that put real use to the enhanced graphical abilities. So we're going to be focusing on what the vast majority of games uh, and what people were used to uh, with the classic Amiga line. And this was, uh, uh, the Amiga was introduced about 34 years ago. Uh, so this game you see here was uh, uh, running on a 34 year old computer so it was very advanced graphically for the time and the Amiga has a very rich and interesting history over the 30 plus years that it's existed with its successes and failures and different marketing approaches in different countries and the sort of personalities the inventors of the Amiga's hardware and how their philosophy clashed with management and marketing and a lot of really interesting things about the history of the Amiga. So if you find this video interesting and want to learn more, we'll link uh, to a nice two-part documentary that's on YouTube in the description of this video. So a little uh, personal history. I was actually a teenager when my older brother bought an Amiga and so it was Amiga Computers and a program called Deluxe Paint and then later a program called Brilliance that I learned the pixel art skills that I was able to use to get a job in the industry as a professional pixel artist. And so I have a long-standing love for the Amiga as a platform. Uh, it was very creative oriented. It was marketed very much for visual artists and musicians and the community around the Amiga was very centered around that and there were a lot of uh, programmers as well so the attitude in general was if there was not a program yet that did what you needed for it you would just make it yourself so it, it was just a very active and still is and very creative community yeah I was gonna say lo looking at how you know, the capabilities of the Amiga at the time. I mean, I, I didn't know much about it when I was young. Yeah. I learned how to do pixel art, you know, on like DOS, MS yeah. Paint kind of thing. And I wasn't impressed by art programs until, you know, Windows kind of came around and I was, I could use something more advanced like Photoshop right. or something. Right. So yeah, I, I can see why this machine, you know, was attractive to people who wanted to make graphics and things like that and why you know i i totally understand and yeah. uh, it is a shame that it didn't make as much of a mark in the united states because right. for that reason like you know i yeah for i a didn't lot of know reasons. much about it i hardly ever even yeah. saw one I, I heard the name but i you know what right. i mean it's that kind of thing so yeah and th that was not only bad for americans but it was uh 
in my opinion, like there's so many stories that all of us Amigans, we all know all of the main stories of how and why, you know, uh, legal issues and marketing blunders and mismanagement in different situations. But really, all of those things, the Amiga could have, su could have survived if they had managed to really put a dent in the American market which the Amiga was very capable of doing. It it brought the goods. It had the hardware, it had the software that it needed, but a combination of different things, but especially marketing, especially mm -hmm. early on, they were not able to saturate the American market, and that would have given them so much more of a budget and so much more time, and so it would have put so much more creative manpower behind the Amiga as a platform that could have changed everything. There, history right. could be extremely different right now as far as personal computer goes if they had managed to really do even close to as well in the American market as they had been doing in places like the UK and Germany. Um, well, there very yeah. well could be an alternate reality out there yeah. where it was a huge smash success. Exactly. You never know. A much better dimension. But <laughs> right. <laughs> um, but uh so one thing that's interesting though this this applies to way more than just pixel art you probably don't know this uh because you haven't heard much of the amiga but have you ever heard of the video toaster i've seen a bit but i, I okay. don't know much about it so those were all amigas and even the first maybe all generations of video toasters that you would plug into a windows pc or maybe a mac i don't even know had an entire Amiga in the box. Oh. So the Amiga, it, even the, like the first OCS Amigas 34 years ago that were introduced, they offered a special graphics mode called HAM, Hold and Modify. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it wasn't perfect. It had almost like a built-in artifacting, not too dissimilar from JPEG compression. But it had nothing right. to do with compression, really. It just had to do with what kind of trickery it had to use to get that many colors on screen. But you basically could have up to 4,096 colors on screen, which at the time mm. was unheard of. Right. And so there was, in large part because of that, the Amiga computer was the hotbed that really started to allow anybody with a small budget to be able to do video titling, video editing, special effects, 3D rendering, all of that was happening on the Amiga, and they had the lion's share of the market. Like, literally, a couple thousand dollar video toaster with the software that it came bundled with, which, again, keep in mind, was just an Amiga computer with, you know, like, maybe a little RAM expansion, but just like a stock Amiga with some of the upgrades that were available in general and then a, a suite of software that the company made to go along with it for video titling and all of that mm. stuff you could do stuff with it that until the year before or the month before the amiga like the video toaster was released cost like you you would have to buy like a forty five thousand dollar custom system specifically for video editing Right. So the Amiga changed everything when it came to not just pixel graphics, but actual broadcast video. It was used as recently as, do you remember Babylon 5? Yes, yes. Like the original season of Babylon 5, a lot of the effects and renders and like titling and stuff like that was done on a video toaster. There was a Robocop TV series. I think Max Headroom, they used the Amiga on stuff. So it was very, like, it just made this kind of digital art form available to the masses uh, right. long before it was really viable um, on PCs. And we are going to get into the AGA chipset near the end of this discussion, like I said. Mm -hmm. um, but what one thing that's interesting about the Amiga's history is when the Amiga first came out, its graphical abilities dwarfed the abilities of the average piece windows pc in the day or dos pc in the day and the amiga community were very proud of that fact it was like a it was like one of the big things about 
the Amiga and being an Amigan was this, you know, superior next generation graphical abilities for artists and for games. And then uh, eventually, once IBM made that really foolish deal with Bill Gates, and then that opened the floodgate for cheap uh, Windows compatible clones eventually. Right. So the price versus what you get for Windows PC started skyrocketing. And because of the ever shrinking uh, sort of market share of the Amiga, their dwindling income, again, in large part because they never saturated the American market, they had been working on a triple A, th their next generation graphics architecture that would still keep them above what Windows PCs were capable, but they had to abandon that. They ran out of funding, they ran out of time. So they had to take a half measure. They abandoned the AAA chipset, even though it was largely developed at the time. And they had to go with what they called AGA, which again was just like a fast, cheap half measure. And mm -hmm. while it is drastically more powerful than OCS Amigas, it still was not as powerful as even your average Windows PC was then capable of at the day. And that uh, right. obviously that was a big one of the nails in the coffin of the Amiga in general as a platform. But it was also very frustrating to the Amiga community in general. Very disheartening. Yeah, since since they were full blown computers, you know, it, yeah. it they, they were trying to sort of be all things. Exactly. And if you had this hardware in just a console that was fairly cheap to people, right? You know, like it, it, it might have actually had a life and been sitting there next to something like the Mega Drive or whatever. Right. But you know, it sort of never. To me, yeah. it seems like it never fully found its identity. Like it has the problem. Yeah, yeah. It, it was, was a, marketing. It was trying to do all things. And, right. Uh, but see, the thing is, that wasn't the problem. The fact that it was trying to do all things was not the problem because it was capable of doing yeah, things, computer, all of those yeah, things yeah. very well. And it was revolutionary that, that they had that frame of mind, the actual engineers that created the Amiga chipset and then the operating system. Also, one of the, if not the first publicly available casual user multitasking operating system. So that's mm -hmm. another huge deal. You can just run a word processor and a graphics program and listen to music all at the same time. Right. That was another pretty much first was introduced on the Amiga. But the point was, this was a system that can do everything and almost do everything all at once, which was right. an, um, an amazing feat. And it, it was there. It was impressive enough. They just needed the right marketing. But I was there and I was witnessing the marketing and it was always they'd start marketing toward one of the things like they would say, hey, you know, we're a viable business machine and they'd try to market it as a business machine mm -hmm. and then they'd back off of it and then they'd say, oh, look, you can play good games with it and they'd market it as a game system and then they'd kind of back off of it. They should have just kept marketing it as everything and then in the mass media, they should mm -hmm. have said, you buy this one system, you can have arcade quality games and your kids can do their homework and get this super cheap or box it with a CD based encyclopedia. It would have been so easy with the right marketing to say, hey parents, you buy this one thing, your kids aren't going to be complaining they don't have a, uh, a console and right. they're going to have a great system to do their homework on and to study on and you can use it for your bookkeeping and stuff like that it can do all of those things every bit as well as any other computer and obviously much better when it comes to graphical design and music if your kids into music it would have been easy to market it yeah but that would have been the trick to market it and i'm sorry everyone that this is not graphic specific yet but uh, hopefully you find it interesting there we go. This is the final boss. We're going to get into this later. <laughs> I was telling this to Corey uh, earlier. The final boss. Like This game looked beautiful for the time. It was jaw-dropping 34 years ago. I remember the first time I saw an Amiga, I walked into the... We, before we owned an Amiga in our household, we had a Commodore 64, like almost everyone else did back in the day. And so we went to a specialty computer store that sold Commodore 64. And since the Amiga was also produced by Commodore, that store had an Amiga on display. 
and they were running a game like this. I don't know if it was this game, but they were running one of the newfangled Amiga games on it, and it was jaw-dropping. How many colors, and the parallax scrolling, and amazing sound quality, and stuff like that. And so, but <laughs> the problem is, here you have this visually and, and musically amazing game, but the gameplay is not good, and then you get to the final boss, <laughs> and you it's a you're fighting a foot and you kill this giant enemy by repeatedly punching his overgrown toenail on his big toe <laughs> but anyway that, that's a, that's a digression for where we are at the moment but hey it was on screen but anyway what what were we just talking about yeah so what they should have done in my opinion is in general computing magazines and even video game magazines and tv spots when they had them they should have said this is the system for everything this this will do everything you want an electronic device for in your home as far as uh computing right video games homework right. learning stuff learning music producing graphics uh bookkeeping filing your taxes can do it all you know, word processing, obviously, all great stuff. Just sell it with an encyclopedia thing and a nice game and a word processing program. You're in really good shape. And then in specific magazines that are specifically for business, then advertise it more as, look how good this is for business. Look what it's capable of. Look at it, the really nice, colorful pie charts you can do for your presentations. Before there was PowerPoint, there was the Amiga. Mm -hmm. And you could do much prettier graphical presentations and stuff like that with the Amiga. It would have been very easy to say, look, all your stuff for businesses, spreadsheets, it can do all that like IBM PCs, but you can also do much nicer looking presentations and much easier on the Amiga. Right. So that's how you would advertise it. And though you would do specific targeted advertising in specific media. We are back. I just took a quick break to switch off of... I'd hate to spoil the ending after you beat the big toe of Shadow of the Beast. So I figured right. I'd switch to this. This was an old promotional video for the video toaster. So I figured I'd have that running in the background. And uh, so I just wanted to mention it was really frustrating to me. I loved the Amiga system. I saw what it was capable of. And as an American, I grew up with arcade machines from Japan as a giant part of American pop culture and entertainment by that point, the 8-bit Nintendo, and then even the Master System, aka Mega Drive, everywhere else in the world. And it really frustrated me that the Amiga was clearly so capable of doing console and arcade quality games but games that were released that actually were up to that standard of quality, both visually and especially in gameplay, was very, very rare. And we're going to mention some of them during this video, but it was just very frustrating. And then even ports of AAA games, one of the ones we're going to talk about soon, is Final Fight by Capcom, a very famous and well-respected arcade game. And uh, the Amiga version, like so many ports from arcades while they were, you know, while it was still a viable marketplace, even AAA ports, they would be given a very tiny team, a very small budget in a very short amount of time to port the entire game for, for scratch to the Amiga. And that's bad enough. But to make matters drastically worse, there was another 16-bit computer in the day that was also fairly popular called the Atari ST. And an issue was they both had the same main processor, the Motorola 6800, I think. Because they had the same processor, very often one programmer would be tasked with making simultaneously the Amiga version and the Atari ST version of a game or the port of that game. And the issue was the Amiga had a bunch of custom graphics hardware to be able to do all the cool graphics stuff far beyond what other computers were capable of. And, but because of the short development time and, and uh, only having one programmer, having the, the guy that did Final Fight, he had like six months to port Final Fight from scratch simultaneously on the Amiga and the Atari ST. So of course he could he did not have time to put full use to the Amiga's graphical abilities and so many games suffered that way. And just to, to explain what the general differences were, sure the main processor was the same speed, but on top of that the Amiga had an entire dedicated blitting system and blitting is drawing and moving pixels on the screen. 
And what's interesting about the Amiga is unlike every console and every arcade board back in the day that used sprites for moving objects, sprites uh, can be great for arcade machines and consoles because they're rendered by a separate part of graphical hardware and it's treated as a completely independent layer. So you can move sprites extremely quickly without worrying about the background. It's totally separate from the background. When you're blitting graphics over your background, you're actually erasing the background where you place the blitted object, also known as a bob. When you draw your bob down, you're actually covering over those background graphics. So you have to do something called double buffering, where you're saving that background graphics in a different piece of memory. You draw your blitter object on and then when you need to move that blitter object again you have that patch in memory to sort of fix the background. Right. So it takes a lot more graphical processing power but they gave the Amiga that extra drawing power but what they did not do was give the Amiga a lot of sprite power. Anyway, I'm getting ahead of myself but the... so the Atari ST was only capable of displaying 16 colors on screen in general using 16 color indexes or indices whereas the Amiga even the original OCS could display 32 and as certainly Corey knows but hopefully other people know when you give twice as many colors to a pixel artist the resulting graphics can look far more than just twice as colorful oh yeah yeah so the difference is absolutely massive but so many games it was just brought down to the lowest common denominator which was the graphical abilities of the Atari ST because they didn't have time and money to pay multiple artists or an artist to do the graphics for both systems and to redo them with higher color for the Amiga or to do them for the Amiga in 32 color and then carefully port it down to 16 color for the Atari ST. So would you say yeah, that this I, you said it it was a budget thing. Yeah. Would it be sort of like a lot of these people were just programmers porting the games and they didn't even have an artist or yeah, something like they, that? They just weren't even given an artist. I had read that the programmer tasked with doing that port of Final Fight. I just found out today that they did hire an artist to quickly do the environment tile maps for him because the ones from the arcade machine weren't viable because they relied on layered scrolling and way too many color indexes. So they right. did have an artist do the background, but for all of the character art and stuff like that and like the character select screen and all that, before he could even start programming the game, he had to come up with his own system to rip the graphics out of the arcade board and just use this raw mathematical algorithm to figure out this nasty one-size-fits-all 16 color palette to remap all of the graphics to, which right. uh, actually I took some screenshots of. Uh, hopefully you can see this. this yeah, I can it, see yeah. a lot of color got lost, you know, yeah. in this. Right. Things became way too sharp, very 8-bit looking in the background, just like really vivid teal window frames inside a overly dark red brick background, all that kind of thing, like bright blue shadow in the pavement. It's not horrendous, but compared right. to what the Amiga could do, the other issue too is the Atari ST had a color bit depth, meaning like color fidelity, where its total range of possible colors it could generate was out of a selection of 512 colors. The Amiga had a, such a higher bit depth that it could generate 4,096 different colors. So right, that four, four mass, bits four, per channel. Four, yeah. yeah, exactly, four, as opposed to three. So mm -hmm. the color fidelity difference, and the Sega Mega Drive or Genesis as we Americans know it, it's uh, the same thing, 512 colors. And that was another way that Amiga ports suffered from this lowest common denominator workflow that they used for the sake of budget to just get the game out with the least investment and make those sales in time for Christmas. So yeah, so one guy had uh, six months to recode the game, rip the character sprite graphics, and reprogram it to use blitting instead and all this. So uh, given those circumstances, he did an amazingly good job. The problem right. is those circumstances made it impossible to look remotely as good as it could have if 
they had more time and they had given him a dedicated artist to carefully and lovingly craft a 16 color palette using the full color fidelity and then using a critically important thing that's really quintessential to Amiga graphics which is using the co-processor that is called the copper chip to change what color any given color index is displaying per horizontal row of pixels right so th those are called scan lines so every line across the screen on the next line you could change what the color in a given color index will display and that could have been used to drastically improve the visual quality especially of the background in a game like this and this level suffered even more and then here's inside the subway and you can see even given this palette if they actually had a dedicated artist to clean up and hand improve the sprite work based on this one palette you can mm -hmm. see they have an almost black color, which they use in a lot of the sprites. But because of the raw remapping, it wasn't used at all in this character who's supposed to be clad in a deep red leather outfit. Right, yeah. And it would look so much better if they worked some of that black in to shadows the darkest shininess, creating that sort of specular effect of a leather. Mm -hmm. And it just, it looks so bad and 8-bit because, again, they didn't have a dedicated artist in the budget. But they could have if they were going to sell to tens of thousands or potentially millions more people in America. If they right. had the American market, it could have been very different. And the other thing that's really interesting about games and marketing and the standards for arcade games, one thing I found out when I recently went to an Amiga convention in Germany, I'll talk more about that later or in another video, but one thing I learned talking to Germans and other Europeans that were there that I had no idea, I had always wondered why there seemed to be such a different attitude toward games, including on the Amiga. Even the developers, most of them, there was a very computer game mentality amongst the the consumers and the developers where there were amazing computer style games like sim city and there's a great game called settlers by a german company called blue bite simon the sorcerer adventure style games point and click style games but very few arcade style games and even the ones that were arcade style they just really fell short when it came to gameplay design. And another, to an American, incredibly frustrating and bizarre thing that you had this computer that was so capable of console quality games. And it just went on for decades without having a remotely official multi-button control pad. You right. know what I mean? Like the 8-bit Nintendo, the Master System, the Turbo Graphics, the eventually the, the Mega Drive. It was all very proven. The whole world loved control pads or you know yep. maybe everyone yep. but a pocket in the UK and Germany and especially wanted that kind of uh, input device with more than one button people in Japan and America they would not settle for a clunky grandpa joystick with one button especially right, not right. to play a game like Final Fight but that was another thing that really horribly affected the overall gameplay experience for even relatively well done arcade ports on the Amiga is they felt it necessary to support one button joysticks right. and all of these things if they had managed to get into the American market the American consumer base it would have raised the bar they would have basically demanded a multi-button controller like a standard not overly expensive multi-button controller and would have demanded higher quality at that point the Mega Drive was out they were used to going to the arcades if Americans saw this port of Final Fight they largely would not have purchased it right and so raising that standards the, the prospect of making a lot more money if they spent a little more time on the port and gave them a dedicated artist and things like that and put out a good quality or even just paid a third party like Mad Cats or Competition Pro to make a compatible controller that they could support games for would have made a massive difference. The point I meant to get at here that I never got around to was I discovered while at Amiga 34 in Germany that apparently when arcade games were extremely popular in America and any kid could go to local stores and arcades and play all of the Japanese arcade games, in a lot of Northern European countries, the uh, 
arcade games were actually restricted to people 18 years of age or older because they were considered gambling. So while American kids were growing up extremely exposed to Japanese arcade games, a lot of European uh, kids were growing up without anywhere near as much exposure. But anyway, right. eventually we need to start talking about graphics more specifically. So it just goes to show you, like, if, if they j had just had a, a dedicated artist and could have spent time setting up those copper color changes and being more careful with the palette, even keeping the game technically running with 16 color indices, it could have looked drastically better. And we'll touch back on that later when we show the project that we're working on, Metro Siege, which is a Final Fight style game that actually does run on those 34-year-old the Amiga computers, but before then I've got some other points I want to quickly cover. And before I move on to other subjects entirely, I've got a few more screenshots that really show how horribly some of the characters suffered from being remapped down brute force to this one 16 color palette you can see here. Right. And then this is really bad. Andor's legs are completely disappearing into the same solid red color of the background of this overly saturated street. Mm -hmm. And then now we're moving into another game, so we might as well go into this idea too. So some games suffered because it was a port from arcade and then they were going to be porting to the Atari ST at the same time. So they just went with the lowest common denominator, 16 color out of 512 color fidelity. But in the case of the Bitmap Brothers, they were making original games, but the same issue applied it would maybe double or certainly increase the time it would take them to make a game for both platforms if they had to redo a lot of the graphics to add or reduce twice as many colors. Right. So what they did is they had a very capable artist come up with a system of using 16 colors effectively in a style that they thought was appealing enough to potential buyers that would work so he could do the graphics once and and use it on both systems but the big downside of that obviously it was great for them financially but the downside was the Amiga version while usually its frame rate would be a bit better that was really overwhelmingly that was the only difference there might be a smoother you, you could see here that thing I mentioned before the copper color changing right, so this is yeah. something you see in almost every Amiga game or especially the side-scrolling games that whole gradation that sky in the back there all that color on screen that's one color index where the copper the coprocessor chip is going okay now on this skin line it's going to be display this rgb value and so on and so forth and this game only does it to this one color index but the amiga was capable of doing it to many many color indexes per scan line with no problem at all and remember this is the color fidelity of 4096 possible colors so they could do the same kind of trick on the Atari ST, but the color range would be drastically less smooth because it doesn't have anywhere near this color fidelity to create this smooth of a gradient. So that would right. be the other improvement on the Amiga, but that's very negligible compared to what the Amiga is really capable of. Like you could imagine what you could do if you could repaint these graphics having twice as many color indexes. But anyway, so this was the color scheme that this artist came up with where you've got a range of brownish colors and a range of bluish gray colors and that's mostly it there was one color that he reserved for copper color changes the gradient effect here for the sky and then you could see there's like one green color that he sneaks in occasionally so there's one unique color and then one gradient color on top of the range of browns and the range of bluish grays and yeah. every 16-bit like Amiga Atari ST Bitmap Brothers game that I can think of, the artist used this very same palette scheme. And then this, you see the same exact system being used. And this is just now we're finally getting into some constructive criticism. Um, right. There's that thing that you're going to hear me mention in probably every forensic pixology video, which is confetti syndrome. Mm -hmm. Yep. And this screen needs to communicate very, very clearly to the player. And if I were art directing this game, or if I had been the artist on the game, if you look here, these are the different shop items you can get. Mm -hmm. And a huge amount of pixel real estate was wasted on most of these items 
arbitrarily putting it behind a shield type thing and right. then not filling the entire like just to have that little bit of a green brick pattern behind there and then having that siren light whatever this light it looks like a, yeah, an upside it, down it, police it, light all of these things is giving you less and less visual real estate and distracting you from what the actual items are right, right. even the amount of design around the yeah. stone and everything and the right. contrast on it is you know it's blast your eyes right. so you know, well, yeah and that's exactly what I mean by confetti syndrome everything on the screen is or almost everything is rendered with the same level of contrast and level of detail so every pixel is or everything represented by pixels it's all fighting for your attention right which is a big that's that's a critical thing for a video game artist to keep in mind when they're designing the graphics for the game is visual communication is the most critical critical task. The player needs to know at a glance immediately what is relevant, what is not, and that the information of that item should be conveyed as well as possible. If something is yeah, good, it, make it look like it's good for you. If it's dangerous, make it look dangerous. If it has it's to be quick and efficient exactly. uh, with, with the communication because yeah. I find myself looking at this yeah. and I'm having to sort of search around exactly. to look at the actual items. More so, it's more work for your eyes and your yeah. brain than it needs to be. You and know? Then uh, to make, yeah, and to make matters worse, you've got all these items here, which I don't even know if you can interact with at all, but it's just right. further distraction. Everything that you can't interact with should be more in shadow, it should be lower contrast, it should be less vibrant. And then things that are critically important and communicating to you, make them as large as possible within a sensible amount of space. And so much right. room is being wasted first on the main architecture of the arcs that frames each item, but that would be fine if they wanted to go with that. If they, in general, made the architecture lower contrast and didn't waste so much space with this light thing or whatever it is, and then these background bricks, it would have looked better if they used only two colors or even just had the inside of each arch just black or the darkest blue-gray color. Right, yeah. It's just too much. So anyway, right. that for anyone that will be working on video game graphic design, I suggest you keep that in mind. And then you like you have things like this here, the exit sign. Maybe the thing you have selected, the brick glows and turns red. Mm -hmm. But if that's the case, that makes it even less necessary to have a light, which also doesn't make sense because this is supposed to be taking place in ancient Spartan Greece. Yeah, I mean, you know what I mean? just... Like they they didn't have to actually put a light there to have the thing light up, you know. Exactly. It's like people would have accepted the right. item being brighter or something right. without that. It's know? just like, wasting space to have the light. It's redundant. Yeah, yeah. And so, it's red, yeah. so it draws your eye away from the item a little bit, you know. Right, exactly. So. so anyway, that's it for that screen. So in general, yeah, I was going to talk about just very often in the game, less is more. And especially in areas where critical things like characters, enemies, pickups, deadly items, this is the right idea here. So the character is going to show up very nicely in general over mm -hmm. something where you've reduced contrast and you've simplified detail. You're not using as many colors, you're not adding as much detail. So I think the game actually visually would look even better if the artist had gone even further. Mm -hmm. Like in general, a lot of this is just, he's gonna be able to walk right in front of it and its level of detail and contrast is too close to that of, especially his gray armor, which is already pretty dark. He's right. gonna get lost pretty severely over a lot of this stuff. And to make matters worse, that's the other thing I was going to mention about this method that this artist used. While in general it looks pleasant, especially back there was nothing but blurry TVs and CRT monitors, there was mm -hmm. no need to make only two gradations of browns and grayish blues and make them so smooth. Right. He would have had a lot more freedom and would have been able to make things look much more colorful and therefore the player character and the enemies could have popped off of the background graphics a lot better if he had reserved a couple more color indexes specifically to make nice, more muted background elements, especially for the places where important things like the player are going to overlap a lot. Yeah. Like, yeah. for example, there's no reason for that ladder to be so vibrant. Like, right. make it clear that it's a ladder and you can climb up with it, but it doesn't need to be even more vibrant and uh, contrasty than the player himself. Mm-hmm. 
this screen especially suffers major confetti syndrome. There yep. is so yep. much detail and so much repeating pattern of these bricks, even when he darkened it here in the shadow area. Keep in mind, a fellow artist or aspiring game designers, when something goes into shadow, it doesn't just get darker, it loses detail. The human eye isn't going to see the same level of detail. So right. he shouldn't have just darkened this. He should have killed the highlights entirely. He should have simplified the amount of texture inside those shadowed bricks. And in general, these bricks, everything is so high contrast and so overly detailed. It's yeah, extremely I mean, distracting. It's... It's like those enemies, they, they look interesting when you look at them, but you can't fully make out their silhouettes very well because of the backgrounds they're on. You know, right. uh, that's that's part of the issue I have looking at yeah, this. Yeah, exactly. So. And that's the key thing to keep in mind as a video game artist, whether you're a pixel artist or a 3D artist, it doesn't matter. Readability. The ability for the player at a glance to immediately know exactly what's going on, which includes what is the enemy doing or what is the player doing based on my input. Is the player doing the move I want them to be doing? Is the player safe right now? Are they defending or are they dodging or are they attacking? And silhouette is critical for that. And the more distracting the background is, the harder it is to, at a glance, immediately read. And remember, literally, you've got fractions of a second. That fast, the player needs to instantaneously know what's going on. Yeah, it, it literally affects gameplay because exactly. someone could test this environment, for example, yep. with just placeholder boxes and, and not have any graphics there with the, maybe the finished enemies or something. Yep. And then as soon as they throw these graphics in, suddenly people testing the game are just going to have a much harder time playing. Seeing because, what's going on. You know, so, uh, yeah, so imagine that. This game might be more fun, might not be as nice and overall experience but might actually be easier to play and more fun if these graphics were replaced with one color simple shapes that are easy to read and that communicate clearly so like that's an extreme example but it's heading in that direction the more confetti syndrome a game gets the more true that is and this particular right. screen in general is really pushing that envelope. Right. And, and this game is kind of the <laughs> ultimate example of another point that we're about to go into that ties in to the specific graphical abilities of the Amiga hardware. And this game is an amazing example of the technical aptitude of a lot of these programmers for the Amiga. We're doing amazingly technically impressive stuff. But unfortunately, the vast majority of artists working on the Amiga did not have the level of schooling, training, or sensibility to really put full use and often were fighting against what the programmers were able to pull off. And it's just a shame. This artist was doing a perfectly decent job with the general design and the art itself. But the right. color usage and contrast and some of those decisions really adversely affected not only the, the playability of the game, but the overall visual appeal of the game as well. But before we go too much into the actual sort of pixel art critiquing of this game in general, I want to first show everyone a game called Mr. Nuts on the Amiga, which is a shame. As I started mentioning before, the hardware designers for the Amiga went in a very different direction from the arcade boards and consoles, and that is that they gave it a lot of blitting power, but they gave it very, very humble, nearly non-existent in many cases, sprite power which again most arcades and consoles use exclusively sprites for all the moving objects on screen so your average mega drive or arcade board could have hundreds of sprites on screen the amiga on paper could have eight three color 16 pixel wide <laughs> sprites on screen which right. is for arcade style games extremely underpowered However, they wanted you to mostly use the blitter, and there's a lot of tricks you can use to get incredibly good use out of the Amiga's relatively humble sprite power that I'm going to get into later. But the point of mentioning this game and showing everyone Miss Nuts, let me make it full screen and get it actually playing. So the actual programming for this game and overall quality standards are extremely high. It 
almost looks like a high quality Mega Drive game, uh, other than the fact that you're just a squirrel and you're fighting like really generic looking cartoony chickens. But as far as the overall visual quality, it's very high, it scrolls extremely smoothly, nice colorful parallax scrolling with a lot of layers. It's got everything going for it compared to Mega Drive games except for one problem. This team decided to program it virtually identically to, to as if they were programming it for the Mega Drive. In fact, they may have done that for budget reasons. They may have been simultaneously coding the Mega Drive version and the Amiga version. Uh, right. But the problem when you do that is, on paper, you can use what's called dual playfield mode on the Amiga to get two layers of scrolling, which is very similar to what the Mega Drive does. You can have two separate layers of scrolling, but the Mega Drive is better than that because it has a tile-based background graphic drawing system. The bad side is it has virtually no blitting abilities compared to the Amiga, but because it's tile-based, it's really efficient for memory. You can flip tiles on the fly while you're drawing them. And more importantly, you can draw tiles from any of the multiple 16-color palettes. Right. So it's just way more powerful in that regard than the Amiga. So the first giant penalty is going to be, as soon as you go into two-layered mode, because it doesn't have a built-in tiled graphics mode, suddenly each layer of scrolling can only display seven colors plus a background color, which for the foreground layer, that background color is just transparent so you can see the background layer. Right, yeah. So now you have this huge problem. Not only are you taking a massive number of color per layer hit versus the Mega Drive, but with the Mega Drive, you had all those colors you could display on each layer, and then you still had all those sprites going where you could display nice 16-color sprites all over the screen for your player character, for HUD elements, for enemies, for explosions, for pickup gems, all those sorts of things. On the Amiga, if you decide to use dual playfield mode, you've got your seven colors for the back layer, which they did a nice job. They used the copper to change some of those color indices. So you see you have this strong blues, and then they change the colors that are being used. So you have purples and then brownish reds in the hills and then the greens. So they got a lot of color in that back layer okay. using the copper. But in the foreground layer, now you've got a huge problem. You've got seven color indexes you can use. And it's not just the foreground graphics you need. It's not just the environment graphics. Because the Amiga's sprite abilities are so limited, they used almost all of the Amiga sprites for just the player character to give him his own 16 colors so he could look good. Right. And I think they use a couple of sprites maybe for the HUD elements. Now there's nothing left, so pick up items, enemies, and dangerous things in the environment all have to share the same seven colors as the foreground environment art. And you're going to see as I let this play, enemies, pick up items, and then this was another copper trick you can see, to digress for a second here, this is using the copper, the coprocessor, to change the entire 32 color palette from this line down to create the illusion that he's underwater to tint everything. Right, so yeah. they did the same exact thing in Sonic on the uh, Mega Drive. Yeah, but this anyway. is kind of a, you know, yeah. like a Sonic wannabe game, yeah, I exactly. guess. You know? So you can see here, you've got this mushroom that he can interact with, same exact green from the grass, same exact few brown colors from the foreground. But because this is overwhelmingly one solid color, it stands out enough. It still looks way less colorful than it would on a Mega Drive, but it's not too bad. And then they cleverly use the red variant down here to get some variety. But same issue, we're using the same seven colors, and it's going to look worse and worse in other areas where you're going to see they're going to have green gems against green leaves, and you're hardly going to be able to see them. Yeah, and it, the fact that this is sort of supposed to be like Sonic, yeah. like it, this would be like, oh, this is the Amiga's version of Sonic. Right. You know, that very fact sort of makes it really stand out as like, right. well, clearly they couldn't Inferior. make Sonic. Right. Yeah, say, oh, oh, well, the Amiga, the Amiga or the same game, you know. Exactly. 
So you could see those gems, you're in the same... So this indent or embossed in the background is using the exact same colors and level is, level of contrast as this gem that you can actually interact with. And at a mm -hmm. glance, tell me, does this thing look any more relevant than this? Right. The only reason is consciously you can think well typically gems or something and that's shaped like a gem you know mm -hmm. what i mean but that's second level higher brain processing to well and make that it, distinction that's not yeah, a and glance being, that's not your being limited mind. to those you know being limited to those seven colors it's like you've got this dark to bright mm -hmm. they're probably feeling compelled to inject every color everywhere they can just to just to make it look 16 bit, you know, as because uh, if, if you drop some of those values, suddenly you're getting into, you know, it's going to look like an NES game or, exactly. you know what I mean? Uh, it's, it's very close as it is, you know, with the exception right. of that character. Right. But, uh, yeah, it's like you said, screen. if you only have seven colors to use, you're going to feel compelled to use them as much as possible to have color and detail in your graphics. And very often that actually is going to be a bad decision to make. Very often less is more, even if you have only seven colors to go with, not having that brightest highlight in this indent. Uh, mm -hmm. design and just using that brownish color to kind of finish the circle probably would have been a much better decision and that would have really helped these gems that use the same colors show better mm -hmm. and then another thing they could have done is not use the darkest brown except for in an outline for it right that would have helped too like they have enough colors to go around where they could have done that or they could have gone the opposite route and given it maybe even an animated glowing outline using the brightest color and the second brightest color. You know what I mean? Like give it like a two frame or three frame glowing outline. Something right, to yeah. really help it pop out. But anyway, so that is Mr. Nuts. And that's what happens when the hardware people design the Amiga in one way. And while it was capable of doing this stuff, it couldn't compete with the Mega Drive. Whereas if you made the game based around the Amiga's strong suit, then you could have games that visually surpass what the Mega Drive was capable of. And that's like, if you look at games like Shadow of the Beast, it's got more on-screen color, every bit as much parallax scrolling as any Mega Drive game ever had, and a higher color fidelity. So that's one example, and then that other example was, I'm going to go into, where is it? And this is a game mm -hmm. where it suffers horribly from bad decisions of color usage and contrast by the artist but uh there's a massive amount of online color and parallax in this game that definitely rivals the mega drive and if the artist had a good art director helping or if if he just had a few concepts in mind of how to handle contrast and uh and hue and things like that to get a much better sense of depth of how far in the distance those background plants and mountains are, that would have made a drastic uh, visual improvement to this game. And then, uh, and just in general, putting use to the Amiga's uh, far superior color fidelity. But in game here, here's where you start to yeah. really run into problems where everything is so hyper-saturated and, and high contrast, everything, it's that confetti syndrome game, everything is shouting at you for your attention visually. And to make matters even worse, he made some really bad decisions as far as contrast. And from, I really don't get this either. Is, is this, um, there's a tiny tree in the foreground <laughs> I don't understand. And it's super high contrast. But the first time I played these games, when I ran across these blades of grass, and it's even worse elsewhere in the level when it's not on an extreme foreground layer, it's actually on the playable scrolling layer. Um, I literally thought, right here, I literally thought that those were spikes that could hurt me if I walked onto them. They are so okay. high contrast and so sharply designed. And then, meanwhile, I mean, here are even, spikes you can fall on. Like, like every single element has white as its highlight. Yeah. And, and look, you can say, like, well, there, there are decisions made like that to reduce the amount of palette colors needed for highlights or something like right. that. However, when it's pure white, I mean, yeah. even the grass is white. It looks right. like 
wintry grass when I know that's not really what they were going for. Right. You know, it's so um, sharp and so high contrast. At a glance, you think that looks dangerous. That looks pointy. That looks like spikes in a game. Here are spikes in the game, and the only difference is they tinted it red instead of green, and it's a little bigger. But this looks this looks every bit as dangerous. That sky too, that like top part of the sky that's just pure white. Yeah. Have you ever seen a pure white sky in your right. life? I mean, it feels so unnatural. They have all those nice blue colors at the top. Right. They could have used back there right. to tone it down just a little bit. And then know? they're but, transitioning uh, the wrong way. Like it should right, have gone right. more yellow here, orange, red, and then a little bit of toward the purples and then go into the blues and then a black-ish sky. Everything here right. is pure contrast white to black, like right. pure black. Everything has pure black in it. Right. See, it's it's overused. It's like right. it, you can use it tastefully if you are careful. I didn't realize that actually is part of the sky because, yeah. you know, there is that foreground going up there. I thought that was the like ceiling. the HUD. Oh, yeah, HUD. No, yeah, it's, yeah, it, HUD that is the yeah. sky. Like, the top of it is pure black. That is right. That is super... Yeah. white to black uh very fast transition That's, you know very yeah. short um by far the best time to use black is hud bar it works right it makes right. it clean easy to understand especially on 16-bit systems like the amiga it just helps a lot it reduces the amount of screen you have to constantly update for the game which can help improve your frame rate and just allow you to get more moving objects on screen without getting slow down and it just really helps and yeah this game suffers horribly in some screens the artists they yeah, give a yeah. drop a black drop shadow to this timer font and stuff but mm -hmm. sometimes at a glance your score and your timer or whatever this is it's so hard to see right but anyway point is be careful with when you use such high saturation and high contrast that should be reserved for things that are actually important. If something is screaming at your eyes for attention, it should be doing it because it's actually relevant to the gameplay. And a big right. part of that is choosing when not to use such a bright highlight. Just because you can doesn't mean you should. And especially right. when it comes to the further you go into the background or if you're in a dark cave or if there's a dark brick wall, just because you can add more detail doesn't mean that's a good thing. It doesn't mean that helps the gameplay. And it doesn't mean that, that your game will look the best. You'll see that a lot with a, a lot of beginner artists. They're very eager to prove themselves and to show off how detailed and how great they can make every one piece of art they have to make for a game, like a brick wall pattern. Like and even everything. that, what is that, a, a dog, I guess? Yeah, it's like um, some kind of weird mutant it, it's dork, like, dog it's creature. It's so, yeah. like, with that white, it's, like, just blown out. You know, it yeah. feels like it's... The light just, right. it's like the overexposed, a right? Yeah, it's yeah. the entire scene is. And uh, right. I don't know. I mean, you can make things white in your game, but it's got to be like everything can't have a white shine on it. Right. You know, it's. <laughs> and under normal lighting, or especially under lighting like this, even an object that is technically actually white is not right. going to be white. Only the very brightest yeah. highlights on that thing would be white, and that's only if it mm -hmm. were a, quite a shiny object. Right, right. So obviously you would be using grays, and in this case kind of warm tinted colors, even to represent a white object. This is one of those games where whatever screen you've got it on, like you, you literally would have to adjust the settings on your monitor to yeah, like make yeah. the game look better or more pleasant on your eyes or something. Yeah. Like I said, no one thing is badly drawn. He's got some nice, fun, interesting mm -hmm. shapes. He just needed a little bit of art direction, and this game could go from looking drastically inferior from a... I'm not talking about technically. I'm not talking about how much scrolling. I'm not talking about how smooth the scrolling is. I'm talking about from a purely visual standpoint. This could have gone from a game that looks visually inferior to Mega Drive games to being a Mega Drive beater if right, the artist right. just had some better art direction for use of color and contrast. Actually, this would be a good moment. Here's, as you can see, another screen where the score and time yeah. virtually disappear. And this screen has a huge amount of dithering. So, and for those that don't know, dithering is that sort of checkerboard pattern that is used to try to create the illusion of smoother gradients of color or just more colors in general to go around. 
it's like a low res pixel art version of what's called dot screening in printing or cross hatching in drawing where you create like crossing lines pattern to create the illusion of shades of gray, for example, if you're drawing with a black mm -hmm. pen. Or even so, stippling is another. Yeah, stippling, you know, the which dot is, technique. yeah, exactly. Yeah. And that's the perfect segue into what I want to talk about, which is the use of dithering and how that has changed a lot and the attitude should have changed. And it has amongst really professional level pixel artists, there's been a shift in pixel art style and an awareness of dithering and a big part of that comes from the fact that now we're on incredibly crisp LCD screens and not blurry CRT monitors and TVs when we do pixel right. graphics and that makes a huge difference. Before the blurriness of the TVs would hide that dithering a lot. It would automatically yep. blend it together better and it would look much more convincingly like it was just a smoother gradient of, in this example, more grays to create this cylindrical effect. Yeah, and even like if you weren't buying like a high-end television or mm -hmm. something, or a really huge television yeah. back in the day, I mean, most of them, they, they, had, they were pretty fuzzy and they weren't oh, super yeah. high contrast either. You know, yeah. if you had a cheap TV, it, that could have even influenced why people felt the need to do such high contrast. Yes, and, oh, absolutely. You know, in the games, it's because the TVs were a little bit washed right. out. Right, they intentionally then, you know? were making it sharper contrast than they would have because at the end the tv or the crt monitor which was similar technology was going to reduce the overall contrast because all of the pixels were blurring into at the edges so point is modern pixel art has found a sort of halfway point this bridge where the overwhelming majority of people are not going to see the pixel art on a blurry tv or crt monitor anymore Pixel art is being made now for the medium that exists now, which is much sharper LCD, where every pixel is crystal clear. So because of that, now dithering is incredibly visible. It doesn't yep. do the same job. It Super doesn't sharp. Right. So if you are designing a retro game, hardcore you want it to be exactly the style it would have been back in the day, you've got a problem. Because even if you're doing that, 99% of the people at play your game are going to play it on an LCD monitor and it's not going to look the way you intend it. Or in other words, if you're studying the style that pixel artists like this use dithering, they weren't seeing what you're seeing. You're right. copying a style that did not exist. Which yep. actually, this is an art history, hoity-toity, artsy-fartsy <laughs> history. The same thing happened to ancient Rome when they became highly influenced by ancient Greece. And they copied the architecture and the statues. We found right. out fairly recently that in ancient Greece, all those beautiful marble statues of people with incredibly accurate anatomy and stuff, they were brightly painted to look like yep. skin tone and hair color and the robes. But even the Romans in the day didn't know that. By the time Rome conquered Greece and discovered this already ancient Roman architecture and statues, all of that paint had long since eroded away. And so, Didn't they do the same? Yeah, with the, all the buildings and everything, yeah. too. Yeah, now, yeah, yeah. The yeah, buildings, like everything too. was Even painted. Yeah, it was, it was all painted. very colorful. Yeah. Yes. And there's a, one of my favorite expressions from art history or just history in general is captive Greece captured Rome, mm -hmm. which is just a really cool expression. But anyway, the point is Rome ended up copying a style that did not exist. So yep. when they left the marble pure, they thought they were just building upon and amplifying what the ancient Greeks had already achieved. But the fact is, if that paint had not eroded by then, almost certainly the Romans would have been brightly painting all their architecture and statues too, which is fascinating. Talk about a parallel universe. Right. You know I mean? yeah. But anyway, so the point is... Keep that in mind, especially nowadays when overwhelmingly people are going to be seeing the pixels crystal clear. Dithering was done to smooth out gradients, to create the illusion of more shades of a color to get a smoother blend. Especially nowadays, it was true even then, but especially nowadays, remember there are different ways to dither to create that gradient. And dithering does two things. It creates the illusion of a smoother blend, but it also adds texture. 
and the different right. styles of dithering are going to give you different textures and that is critical when you're trying to render different surfaces. So if you're dithering a stone or the ground or tree bark, you're going to want to carefully choose the actual dither patterns you're using or the style of dithering you're using to actually not just give you that added sense of more color or value, but to actually give you a benefit in that texture instead of being a bad thing. So seeing this on LCD, this is actually a bad thing, this dithering up here. This is right. not how the artist intended. They wanted this to look like relatively smooth metallic cylinders. And now on a non-blurry LCD screen, it looks really grainy, like it's made out of cement or something really coarse. And right. so, but this is true even, they just, they didn't give it as much thought back then because the blurriness kind of hid that problem for them. Mm -hmm. But on better TVs, bigger TVs, or just in general, visuals were better by artists that understood that there were different ways to dither and you should do the different style based on the surface. So as you can see, I used the horizontal line approach to create a smooth metallic variant to show how drastically differently you can approach the same problem and have clearly a sense of a different texture. One thing looks right. much more mechanical and smooth and one thing looks much more like, like I said, like it's stone or concrete. And then I took that further with the, the gem here, which has dithering in it here, which obviously makes no sense for a gemstone. And then I just showed there's the flame exhaust here, which is fine. It's not like it's really dithered or anything. And it's nice that he actually used some horizontal lines to emphasize that sense of extreme thrust or motion of the exhaust. Mm -hmm. But I just showed an alternate way of doing it that creates that additional gradation effect, but has a sort of pluming flame smoke kind of effect to it. Mm -hmm. And then the last thing, I just felt compelled to point out how at a glance this player doesn't pop out that well. And right. part of that is just the fairly extreme contrast of that background. So I just quickly tinted this all to be more close to each other in hue, to fall back more, to really help that player sprite pop off of the background better. So astute viewers might be asking, well, if the Amiga could do dual, which means two, playfield mode for layered scrolling, how does this game have so many layers of scrolling going at once and with so many colors? That's a great question. Uh, let's see if we can count how many layers there are. So there's the backmost layer with like the sky, the back mountains, and this like purple water. And then there's that obvious real big mid layer with these mm -hmm. tall mountains that look like they're way too close by <laughs> because they're so yeah. high contrast. Then there's the actual sort of foreground playable interactable area with the platforms and houses and stuff. And then there's down here this extreme foreground that scrolls faster than the player. Uh, and I think some levels have even more in that it kind of slices the back layer, but I could be wrong. But obviously that's like one, two, at least three, you could say three and a half layers of scrolling instead of two. Right. And let me see. Yeah, it seems to be the standard in this case. Let's see if any levels go. Yeah, so... This one, it's got, well, it's hard to count when you pause it. Yeah, some of those cloud layers are scrolling at different speeds yeah. too. Yeah, so this is sliced up a lot more. Um, but it doesn't have the foreground. Oh no, well this would be considered like the mid layer. Yeah, so this has even more layers of scrolling, especially counting the parallax. So the big trick behind this game, remember how I mentioned the Amiga sprites were so weak? There's some really cool tricks and things that you can do with sprites on the Amiga. And I'll start with the basic thing. You start with eight 16 pixel wide, three color sprites. 16 pixel wide, let's say it's roughly like this. Let's see how uh, accurate I was. That's 19, so even a little thinner than that. But that gets the idea across. So not very big in only three color, 
So that would be perfectly fine for fire or explosion effect, especially since you could potentially change the palette per frame of that sprite. So let's say that is a sprite. The nice thing about Amiga sprites is that sprite can be as tall as the entire screen if you want it to, and that's still just one sprite. Most mm -hmm. consoles, there was a specific height limit per sprite too. Even the Mega Drive, I don't remember how high a sprite was, but I think in general they tended to be more square. So it'd be right. like 32 by 32 pixel would be a sprite or something. But it could display like 80 of them or more on screen. I, I can't remember. I think it was more like 100 and something. Point is, it's quite a uh, theory, yeah. yeah, so that's better to know that, okay, it's only 8, but at least they can be really tall. Another thing you can do with Amiga sprites is if you combine two sprites, there's an actual built-in hardware way to tell the Amiga you're combining two sprites to make one sprite. And I don't mean, of course, you can butt them side by side to make a wider sprite, but at least if you need a bigger object, you could do that too. But it's still just three colors for that whole thing. But if you actually overlap them and combine them that way, you don't go up to a six color sprite, you go up to a 16 or 15 and clear sprite. But, so if you do that with every sprite, you can have four 16 pixel wide sprites on the Amiga that could be the whole screen wide. So that's not bad. That's a right. pretty good chunk of the screen you could cover with 16 color sprites. But it gets better still, as we've probably discussed in previous Forensic Pixology videos, with playfield layers, like scrolling layers, you can slice them to make them scroll at different speeds mm -hmm. across the screen, which is what they do for the ground or the water or the clouds in Shadow of the Beast or Jim Power here. But the cool thing is you can do that with the sprites on the Amiga 2. It's a limit of eight sprites per scan line or per horizontal row of the screen, but you can slice up Amiga sprites to be more sprites, pretty much as many as you want, so long as, and they can be anywhere on the screen, so long as you never have more than eight, or in this case we're doing four 16 color sprites per scan line. And what happens if you have more than eight sprites per scan line, that's when you start getting the flicker, which you see all the time in the 8-bit Nintendo and even the Mega Drive when there's lots of sprites on screen. So that's right. not too shabby. So now we're getting to the point where, okay, that's actually quite useful, or it can be for certain games. Like, you can't do a game like Final Fight on the Amiga with sprites, because you're going to run out of 16-color sprites with your first character. You're not going to have yeah. anything left for any of the other characters or objects or explosions or anything else. But what's great is, and let me actually go back to YouTube, and we'll pull up a game that shows incredibly good use of sprites on the Amiga and, and just in general a very high-quality game, which is called Battle Squadron. So a cute 32-color intro screen already that the Atari SD could not do. And then so here we have a nice vertical scrolling shooter. Uh, both players are three color sprites and then they just do a trick to change the bottom color to be a different color that they're color cycling for exhaust. And then when they do that bomb that shoots out all those radioactive colored meatballs, that's all sprites. All of the shots coming out, those are all three color sprites. But if you look carefully, if you pause it at any one time, it's carefully choreographed, so you're virtually never going to get more than eight three-color sprites per scan line. For example, because this is vertically scrolling, the ship, which is two sprites wide, so it's 32 pixels wide, the shots from that particular player can never be in the same scan line as the ship it comes out in front of or behind the ship. Right. So simple things like that, they just allocated, okay, so you could potentially have four sprites side by side with the two players. The it ship, could be that they... Yeah, yeah, it could be that every shot never is wider than the the four sprites you know eight right, by exactly. eight sprites exactly yeah exactly but, so but the other thing is like i said the ship you never have to worry the player can never be on the same level as any of its shots or right. either he could be on level with the shot but not the shot and the the other player or the other player shots it's one or the other per scan line right 
So it's very easy to stay under the 8 limit, but still have a massive amount of brightly colored moving objects, fast moving objects all over the screen. So it was just incredibly good use of the sprites. And I don't even understand how he did it, but I'm pretty sure I read that all of this, watch, look at all the extra attention to quality. Watch when the high score table comes onto the screen. As far as I understand, all of this HUD stuff and all of this insanely colorful color cycling uh, scoreboard is all sprites. And I don't even know how that's possible. Like, that's wider than eight sprites wide. Mm -hmm. But anyway, just amazingly good use of... Uh, and this that's a really cool effect. Can you see that there? Uh, you already yeah. pointed that out yeah. to you, Corey. Because they use the blitter for the enemies and stuff like that, blitting instead of sprites, they can actually manipulate the background graphics to create that displacement effect like it's the uh, Predator Alien in cloaking mode, which was just a really great effect that uh, the programmer came up with for this game. But anyway, yeah, so the enemies and uh, big objects and turrets and stuff like that, those are blitter objects, but the player objects and shots are sprites. So that just did, it put extremely good use to the Amiga hardware, where the appropriate hardware was focusing on the appropriate things and sort of sharing the load. Share the load. Share the load. The load. The load. Right. And you got the best of both worlds. You, you have a game that runs incredibly smoothly with a massive amount of moving objects, and the game isn't 16 color. It's displaying, especially when it has the high score table and counting the HUD, way more than 32 colors on screen. So, and in fact, there is a port of this very game on the Mega Drive, and especially because of the color fidelity, the Mega Drive version is inferior visually. So, right. I'm going to go show you if you use the Amiga hardware in ways optimized for the, the graphical abilities of the Amiga itself, you can really do some great stuff. And one more game to show that really goes to show the difference in just how much blitting power the Amiga has. Here's Toki. So this was an arcade game that a French studio made the Amiga port for. And you might look at this at a glance and say, okay, it's got a back layer of scrolling, so clearly they're using that dual playfield mode. Uh, but they're actually not. And if you count the colors in the foreground, uh, it's actually 32 color uh, foreground um, and an eight color background. And you might ask, how are they doing this? And how come the enemies are actually brightly colored and there's way more than just seven colors for the foreground and the enemies? That's because they used the Amiga's raw blitting power to blit the entire back layer of scrolling. So it's drawing the entire back layer of scrolling, uh, which I think is typically limited to eight color indices. So it, it does that trick to save. So it's not like drawing an entire 32 color screen and then an other 32 color screen with the characters in the background. I think they okay. limited it to drawing the first eight color indices for the mm -hmm. background layer. And then it draws up to 32 colors for the foreground layer, um, you know, like from a tile map. And then the enemies uh, can also use the full 32 color range. Although I think in general they stick to the second set of 16 colors just because uh, that way per level they can completely change the first 16 colors for each environment. I right. think that's what they're doing. But as you can see, uh, very impressive amount of blitting power. You've got all these moving high colored actual player object shots, uh, objects you can interact with, enemies, explosions, sometimes a lot of falling coins as you can see here, all just being done with the blitter. I don't think a single sprite was used for this game, which they could have done on top of that. So it just goes to show you the uh, how much blitting power the the uh, classic Amiga had. Yep. Do you think maybe his his shots that he's shooting are sprites? I or don't think so. I think, oh yeah, and thank you for asking that question because I was going to mention, and incredibly, if any of you watching that find this stuff interesting, someone who is a treasure to the Amiga community named Code Tapper, 
he has this fantastic website in one of the sections. It's CodeTapper's Amiga site. It's just CodeTapper.com. And this site is just an amazing treasure trove of incredible reverse engineering and meticulous analysis of some of the most impressive Amiga games and exactly how they manage to get so many colors, moving objects, or usually so many layers of scrolling on these Amiga games. And you'll see Shadow of the Beast is there. Jim Powers is there and several other games the Amiga port of R-Type 2 which, and so that was the one last trick that I wanted to mention the way they got that extra third or sometimes fourth layer of scrolling in Jim Power and it's the same thing with Shadow of the Beast the way they did that is later generation Amiga games they figured out an incredible trick where you could use the Amigas again the copper the co-processor and you could very cleverly trick the rest of the Amiga hardware, the Amiga sprite chip, into thinking it hasn't drawn one of the sprites yet over and over again. So you can actually create, and the other cool thing is, per sprite you can tell it, do you want the sprite to be displayed in front of the background graphics or behind the background graphics? And that actually includes in dual playfield mode. You can have a sprite behind both playfields in the extreme background. You could have it in front of the first playfield or in front of all playfields. So in the case of Jim Powers, what they did, what they did is they used that repeating sprite trick to create an entire background layer that was however many sprites wide. And I think they they did three color sprites but you could do 16 color sprites like another game risky woods so you can't do completely original art across the whole screen if you do this but you can end up with a pattern of anywhere from like 32 to 64 uh, pixels wide and you can trick the amiga into repeating that pattern across the entire <coughs> screen sorry and even no problem and even scrolling it so if you look at Jim Power here, you'll see it's a repeating pattern. So it's right. only maybe 32 or 48 pixels wide. And then the other cool thing is because you can slice sprites, you can even slice them and, and create a lot of parallax scrolling. Just with what supposedly is very humble sprite power, you can create an entire back layer. And what that can allow you to do, I can show you that game Risky Woods. So really sort fast. of, uh, you know, if you want the most potential beautiful game on the Amiga, you sort of, you're using sprites for the environments. Instead and, uh, of for the objects. And the opposite for your characters. Exactly. You're, you're using glitter objects, which is, which are which is hilarious. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. And all because on paper they designed the sprites too weak, but programmers happen to figure out a trick to allow you to plaster the screen, but you can only do that with a repeating pattern. Right. So, it's most useful for creating a far back layer that it doesn't matter that it's a repeating pattern because you have the foreground environment in front of that to help break it up and you can slice the sprite so it looks less and less like a repeating pattern uh -huh. and uh, let's see here so here's an example this wasn't that well done it's very blatantly a repeating pattern but for the right. sake of education that's not a bad thing but you can see how colorful they used uh, 16 color foreground, which is way better than 7, for a mm -hmm. front layer, and then the repeating sprite trick with its own totally separate set of 16 colors, although you'd kind of never know where they used such so close to a pure gray for the mountains. Right. Like, they should have blued those mountains out even more or made them a blue purple to not only with, whoa, I never saw that before. <laughs> uh, I didn't know they, they, uh, reversed uh flipped the game but um uh, that's freaky but anyway point is you could see how colorful now you can have a 16 color even parallax sliced background layer and full speed foreground layer with 16 colors to use for the environment and the uh the characters and pickups and now you could do stuff extremely comparable and in some cases because of the increased color fidelity superior to the mega drive especially if they had bothered slicing and you can still use the copper color changes so if you have a, a 16 color foreground and you reserve a couple of those color indices to do the copper color changing 
you can have a really beautiful, very, very competitive 16-bit looking game. Uh, and there was no reason for them to put such a massive HUD down here. Right, yeah. You know what I mean? Like, really good programming on the Amiga. They could have had a much smaller HUD and still had all these layers of scrolling and action on screen. But as you can see, so that was the thing. I started to mention that. It, w it really, really frustrated me as an American that grew up with arcade games and NES games and Mega Drive games. I knew the Amiga was capable, and it just bothered me that visually and gameplay-wise, there were very few games. And even games that came close visually and style-wise, they suffered by the fact that they had to pander to the lowest common denominator one-button joystick input, right? which really killed like almost all the platformers on the Amiga. You press up to jump, which just feels horrible. It's great for a Street Fighter style game, but it's just nowhere near as good for a platformer game. There's so much to cover uh, in regards to the Amiga in all the different ways. That's the really other really exciting thing about developing games on the Amiga. There's so many different approaches and different tricks you can use. You can say, oh well, the amount of color indices is more important, so I'll just use a repeating sprite trick for the background and that way I can have 16 or 32 color for the foreground. Or you could say, no, the number of layers of parallax is more important, and use a combination of the repeating sprites and, like Jim Powers did. There's so many different ways. Or you can use raw blitting power, like Toki did. There's so many options it, that's very unique. Almost all consoles and arcade boards, the hardware was so specifically designed a certain way it would be almost impossible or ludicrous or counterproductive to try to do things in a drastically different way. Whereas with the Amiga, the artist and the game designer can really decide any combination of any of these methods, figure out what's best for the visual style and what needs, how many moving objects, how many colors need to be on screen. So in light of that topic, we can mention that we're working on a couple of Amiga-based games ourselves and one we can show now is Damon Claw which is based around the exact technical graphical constraints of the classic Amigas and even more harshly limited because when I did my proof of concept program of the first level in a basic programming language called Amos, because it's not C and assembly, it's even more limited. So to get performance, you have to use even fewer colors, and you can't do copper color changes for as many colors, and you can't blit as many pixels per frame. And despite all those limitations, this uh, is environment and enemy art that Corey has done for our game project, Damon Claw. And I think you'll agree with me. I'll compliment Corey so he doesn't have to do it himself. But just absolutely gorgeous work. And uh, it is a, a valid point to bring up. In line with that less is more thing, it's not necessarily the number of colors you get on screen. It's the artistry, it's the passion and the time you put in figuring out the best use of what you have at your disposal, whether it be how many pixels you can update per screen, how many colors, how many color indexes you can change. The back layer of scrolling in Damon Claw is technically using two color indexes, one background color and then one color that can be changed with the coprocessor, with the copper and you can see just this beautiful sense of atmosphere and depth that Corey has created. Everything just really pops off of the background beautifully. It's extremely easy to see at a glance where you're going to land, what you can interact with and what you can't, what you need to worry about and what you don't. Just beautiful stuff. And we're actually making this game. You can look at our other playlist that's called something like Making Games with Construct, I think. Something like that. We're actually making this game first with a modern development tool called Construct for modern platforms, including Windows, Linux, Mac, Android, and iPhone. And then once the game is done, a very highly skilled Amiga programmer is going to make the actual Amiga version reusing the same graphics that we're making Amiga compliant as we go. So that'll be pretty cool to have a legit retro game that runs on a 34-year-old computer. But uh, let's see some of the other screenshots. Here's a swamp level with splashing water and a uh, swamp man coming out. 
you could see how beautifully the player character pops up off the background. And then these things that are less important, they're pretty, but they don't really distract your attention too much. They're intentionally lower contrast, darkened foreground, kind of spiky cat and nine tail type plants in the extreme foreground. And again, uh, two color back layer, beautiful stuff. Uh, some more enemies, really nice uh, sort of built-in motion blur on the wings there. Great stuff as always, Corey. And a beautiful cave level. And you can see, like, look at the difference. Look how sparingly. Look where in the shadows, Corey knew, in shadow, you don't just, things don't just get darker, you lose detail. And look how Corey was perfectly willing to have very large areas of solid color. And it didn't hurt it. It didn't make it look worse. It made it look better. And it just helps the enemies and the player and everything else just pop even better off of this background. And mm -hmm. uh, same thing with the ground down there. Just absolutely beautiful stuff. Anyway, really excited to have Corey doing the bulk of the graphics for this game. And uh, I'm doing the bulk of the programming. And we're both collaborating on gameplay design as we program it. And you can actually watch us create this game virtually from scratch on that playlist in Construct. So if you're interested in making games, definitely check out that channel. And I think we should pretty much end part one here. I think we covered enough and this video is going to be really long and we've got quite a few other things to cover as we go. Probably when I'm editing this video I'll edit in some actual moving footage of Damon Claw so people can see how this looks and what a beautiful sense of depth and how clearly all of the important objects stand out from the environment. But that's it. I guess we'll end the video here. Did you have any final thoughts, Corey, before we sign out? Uh, no, I believe that's it for now. All right, cool. So that's it for this one. Thanks so much, everyone, for watching. And thanks, as always, Corey. Stay tuned for the next one. It might be a couple of weeks before we get part two out. I'm not positive yet, but uh, hopefully this is enough content to keep you entertained for a while. <laughs>